hello and welcome everyone on uh, so on on behalf of uh, Sheffield Machine Learning Group we are uh, hosting Professor Conrad Cording from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, just a bit. So we, this is our first seminar from the machine uh, learning group side at the University of Sheffield. We also have Eleni Vasilaki as the head of the machine learning group and others uh, from the group and also a lot of people there as well. And this is being, of course, hosted uh, by the Worldwide uh, Neuroscience uh, Forum with Tim Vogels also around and all the organizers, thanks to them. So, OK, so I'll uh, uh, again welcome again Conrad. And uh, he is the uh, Penn Integrated Knowledge uh, Professor at the University of Pittsburgh. He identifies himself on his website as science coach, collaborator, and transdisciplinary optimist. <laughs> so interesting stuff there. Uh, his work is on how the brain solves the credit assignment problem uh, through causality. And he's also interested in using this for uh, biomedical problems as well. Uh, he was at the ETH Zurich with Peter Koenig for his PhD and then postdoc at UCL London with Daniel Wolpert and then MIT with Josh Tenenbaum. And then he spent also a decade at Northwestern and he's now uh, the Penn Integrated uh, Knowledge Professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, so we are again uh, at the so University of Pennsylvania. Sorry, uh, yeah, my mistake. Uh, and uh, so uh, he's going to speak to us about causality in neuroscience, something that uh, we are at the University of Sheffield at the Machine Learning Group very interested in as well. And uh, I hope uh, everybody of you will also uh, enjoy his talk. And then we will open the floor quite early to questions. So please feel free to ask your questions via the links below. The, uh, it's also being streamed live on uh, YouTube and Twitter, so people can join in there as well and being recorded as well. So uh, well, the floor is yours, not... Conrad. Uh, so so thanks, thanks so much for the great introduction. I should also say that uh, I had some audio issues this morning. So I can't uh, promise that there won't be glitches as we, as we start going. So let me share my, my slides already here. Share and then here, and then I should make this and tell it to start playing. And you should now be able to see the title of my talk. Up oh, and uh, here, the title of my talk, which is Causality for Neuroscience. And hopefully, you can still hear me. Yeah, we can. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, the outline for today, I will first talk uh, about causality and causation being very different if you have big systems. Now, like we always say, we always hear correlation isn't causation. And yet when we think about real systems, it seems that correlation kind of always is causation. And like the light switch is very strongly correlated with the light going on. So why is it that that we tell scientists that correlation isn't causation, yet it feels for us so much as if causation is correlation. The second one is I want to talk about the nature of the difference and why in most cases it cannot be overcome, why it's not possible to do causal inference. And then I will talk about how for some clinically relevant applications, we can obtain causality after all which is in the domain of quasi experiments. And throughout it, I will try and make a little bit the link to machine learning and neuroscience, and we'll see how that goes. So let's start with the definition of causality. Now, like people often say causality doesn't really have a definition or something. And like, sure, Aristotle has like six different definitions. But, but for most of us, I think the, the definition of causality is this so-called counterfactual definition of causality. What that means is the following. Let A and B be events. Causation exists if we had changed A to A star, the probability of B would have been different. No, like, and this is a perfectly operationalizable definition. Like we take the world, we, which at some point of time is in state A, we switch it to state A star, and then we see how the world then is different or is probabilistically different. It's hard to measure, and we'll talk about why it's so hard to measure. But in principle, I think this is, at least for me, this is a, this is a perfectly fine definition. And this is the definition of causality that I will be talking about. So now, in neuroscience, 
causality is absolutely central. So what does that mean? What do we want to do in neuroscience? Well, we want to be able to say, predict randomized perturbations. We want to understand causal chains. Now, like if I ask a typical computational neuroscience scientist, what do you want to get at? They will give me a, a definition that kind of says, I would like to see that this brain area makes this brain area do something which then ultimately makes uh, uh, makes the output happen. And in that sense, in some experiments, we can uh, we can observe both versions by randomizing things. And we want to understand the components. So I would also want to emphasize before I start the, the, the talk that everything in machine learning and life is about causal inference. And let me, that seems like an insanely over general statement, but let me see if I can convince you of that. So ultimately our decisions in life are making about the, making the world better for us, or if we are an idealist, making the world better. And what does that mean? No, like ultimately, whatever we do is so that we can make actions based on it. And the same thing is true for machine learning. You know, like we don't build machine learning algorithms just because it's cool to build them. We build because ultimately machine learning algorithms can drive decisions. And that means choosing one action over another. And that means it's a causal problem. Um, and, and in a way, you know, like the ultimate question in life for us and machine learning is, would the world be better for me if I chose A versus B, which is ultimately a causal question. I want to know how changing the decision now affects outcomes that I care about in the future. Okay, so now why is that difficult? It would be very easy if we could take the world in which I choose action A and um, produce a copy of the entire world where I don't choose action A. And then I can observe how those two worlds work. I can see which world is better for me. And then I can choose that world. But of course, we can't because, well, there's no mechanism to copy the world and produce a world where we can, where we can observe the counterfactual, the world where we could observe what would have happened if we hadn't taken that action. Now, so in practice, what we always have are comparisons between stuff that happened and other stuff that in our mind could have happened, but that didn't happen. And of course, then we can only observe one of them. So computationally, why is it hard? We want to understand how one variable affects another, how the lower variable here affects the upper. But the problem is there's not only these two variables in the world. There exist other variables, we call them confounders, that affect both variables. And this problem of confounding is what makes figuring out causality so hard. And now there's a continuum of confounding problems. No? There, are, well, there are situations in which, uh, in which confounders are really not a problem. Let's say playing Atari. You know, like we can observe everything happening within the game and therefore there is no causal inference problem. Or ImageNet arguably doesn't really have a confounding problem. Now there's situations where there are some confounders, let's say StarCraft. Now if I play StarCraft, I, the other player might produce one strategy versus another in this, like here's a certain small number of units and I don't know where they are, things like that. And now there's domains like medicine where we have countless confounders. And if we're in that situation where we have countless confounders, then our situation is very different. But those are the domains in which a lot of the exciting problems are. And those are arguably the domain where, where where medicine matters, no? like, uh, and, and, and also where life matters. No? Like, for me, my choices in life depend on a lot of outside factors. And then there's, of course, cases where we have like a ridiculous number of confounders, brains. When we do brain science, what we typically do, we record a number of channels, maybe between one and 30,000. We can have more if we accept them to be more noisy. But Every neuron does some computation, and therefore we have arguably 10 to the 11 confounders. You might call it infinitely confounded. And because we had some audio prompts in the beginning when we were setting up, can I just ask the, the organizers to briefly confirm that you guys can still hear me? Um, 
Yes, okay, sir. perfect, yeah. perfect. Yes, great. Thanks so much. And I, I apologize for asking. It's a little embarrassing in an online talk, but I just wanted to be sure. Okay, so let's try and get intuition for the problem of confounding. We are simulating the most trivial dynamical system we could think of. And one where causality is well defined. No, we have xt plus one is a matrix A times xt plus noise. And the noise is drawn from a, a diagonal covariance matrix Gaussian distribution. Now, like this might be a model for how the brain works. It's probably a very bad model for how the brain works, but it's a simple model. In fact, it's arguably the most simple model where like any of these questions make any sense. Now you can say A characterizes causality. A characterizes how each element of X influences each other element of X at the next point of time and itself. And now there's of course some choice that we need to make and we choose A to be binary matrix with 10% of the values to be zero. And we also scale it so that the largest singular value is 0.99. Otherwise it could be unstable and we can't meaningfully simulate it. Okay, we have a system. And um, we can then ask, how does the meaningful measures relate to this causal A matrix? Now, specifically, we can calculate the covariance matrix between xt plus 1 and xt. And if this covariance matrix would look like A, then we could use that covariance matrix to get at causality. And if they look very different, we cannot. And so here's the analysis of that. So what we have on the x-axis is how high dimensional the system is. Now, like we simulate that same system, same equations, same scaling, everything, only we change the dimensionality of x. And as if we have a very small system, three, then the covariance matrix, the time lag covariance matrix is almost perfectly the same as, uh, as the causal matrix A. So what we have on the y-axis here is the is the similarity as squared in this case of the co of the components of the covariance matrix you no know, like we take the matrix make it into a vector between the a matrix and the time lag covariance matrix and here's something really interesting in small systems correlation and causation are almost the same so let's go back to the equations to get an idea of that if we have a small system then it is basically mostly driven by that epsilon, by the noise that we're adding. And therefore, they're very similar. But now if we make the system really big, what is driving the system? Well, we have some large singular values here. These singular values ultimately mean that the epsilon of lots of neurons over lots of time points are going to be added into some components. So if we have a small system, it's dominated by the noise that we locally add. If we have a really big system, it is dominated by the dynamics that happen within the system. And for the parameters that we chose here, it's interesting that the transition happens in a, at a relatively large number, now like 100 here. Now up to 100, the two of them are very similar. And if we then go to 1,000 or 10,000, they're very, very dissimilar. Now, the models that we as scientists construct in our heads are small. We are thinking about like 10 variables, maybe 100 brain areas that influence one another. So in our mind, it is one of these systems where correlation and causation are similar. And in fact, if we build a little like toy simulation, they're reasonably similar. So we can convince ourselves that correlation and causation are the sim a similar thing. But then if we go into a scale that's like the brain, it all breaks down and it has in correlation and causation have nothing to do anymore because the system effectively follows its own dynamics. So now the reason why it goes through that is because the idea of taking correlations and concluding about causality is one of the central branches of neuroscience at the moment. And I think it is highly problematic. And let's see why it is so problematic. So, so when we estimate co co uh, when we use correlation to estimate causality, what is it that we do? Well, we run regression, and if we run fancy things like Granger co uh, causality or, or, or all kinds of methods, they they all have that same flavor, and you can just write it out for them as well. So we have the estimate of causality beta hat is the covariance matrix x prime x inverted to the minus one times 
the correlation matrix x prime y. So, but now, what happens if we're missing something? So we will now consider a situation where the real data point y i is it contains one component that we capture. So we measure x, and we want to estimate the causal factors between x and y, or like x and x if we talk about the time varying case. And that's the real causal factors beta that we're trying to estimate. But we also assume that there's other variables that we do not estimate, the zi. And the zi also have effects. They have effects delta. No, because why? what's special about xi? No, like the other variables, the other nuance, the nuance that we don't record, the dimensions that we don't record when we do MRI are just as well variables where the dynamics of the brain unfold. So then we can take this equation for y and put it into the regression equation. Same, no, like we, we have the same as before, x prime x to the minus one, but then we have the second term, which now contains a z component. And then we can uh, calculate what's the expected value. Now, like what would we expect to get if we could run an infinite number of data points? Now, like it's popular on MRI at the moment to get a lot of data points. And um, so, so then we have, um, uh, we have uh, the, the true beta here. The, my estimate of beta is the true estimate, which is great. That's what we want to do. But it has a correction factor. And this correction factor is looks just almost like the estimator for beta, which is it has the covariance matrix inverted times the expected value. And now what we have is the covariance matrix of x and z on the right-hand side. Now, the covariance matrix of x and z are the correlations between pairs of neurons, if we make this concrete, are like of the order of 0.3 or so. Now, importantly, this is a bias. It is not something that goes away if we get more data. Regardless the amount of data that we have, this will bias our results. Now, keep in mind that we have 10 to the 11 dynamical uh, dimensions for the dynamical system. We record a 10 to the 2 or 10 to the 3 dimensional thing. The delta is like of order 1, 0.2, same as 1 effectively. And therefore, the bias should be no, and, and like there's no reason why x would be more or less correlated with the observed components than the unobserved components. So, so basically, we have a term that's just as big, only that we have 10 to the 11 of them versus 10 to the 2 of them in the dimensions that we have actually observed. So we should expect that when we do when we do correlation and machine learning, if you write it out for any machine learning system, it looks just the same. And um, so, so therefore we have no reason to be believe, or like we have very good reasons to believe that this omitted variable bias in our, estim in our, uh, in our estimates uh, is arbitrarily bigger than the terms that we're actually looking for. So what are the popular solutions? We can fit complicated models to that. We can run model comparison, and we can do randomized, uh, randomized perturbations. And, um, and, uh, and then, and I should mention that, so, so the first three don't work for exactly the reasons that I sketched before. And uh, there is an alternative. There's this a set of ideas that are called quasi-experiments. They will not work for the bulk of brain science questions. But there exist versions where they work, and there exist versions where they're promising in the context of both neuroscience and where they're promising in the context of machine learning. So let's briefly talk about the potential outcomes framework. I should say there are two popular schools to causality. One that's very popular in the machine learning community. You probably, many of you will probably have heard about Judy Apal. Um, and uh, another framework that is popular in econometrics. These two frameworks are identical. If you, if you really write them fully out, they're, uh, they, they, they're effectively identical. But there are certain arguments that are very easy to make in the potential outcomes framework that are like less obvious if you start a, a edit from like a Judea Paul type causality framework. So the idea is the following. For every item I in this world, there exists two possible outcomes in the future. There exists an outcome, yi of zero. And it's a weird syntax, but they've been doing that for like 40 years, so, so I'll stick with that. There is how the world for that item or how the future for that item would look like if we don't treat it. That's yi of zero. 
and how the future would look uh, at if we had yi of one. Okay, so in that framework, for example, we can very easily show that randomized control trials are correct. No, and I should say, out of these two out, uh, outcomes, the treated and untreated, we can only ever observe one. No, if we treat one, we cannot observe what would happen if we hadn't treated it. And if we don't treat it, we can never observe what would have happened if we had treated it. Okay, so, but, but, but still, for every item that we have, there exists a real what would have happened if we would have not treated and what would not would have happened if we hadn't treated. So this is what we have here. So we have measurements, one through six here, and of course, any number of them. And we have outcomes, Y0 and Y1. And the treatment effect then is the expected value of Y1 minus Y0, which we know we can approximate as 1 over n times the difference between those. Okay, but here's the cool thing. If we now randomly remove half of those values, where we randomly allocate people to the treatment or non-treatment group, we find that this is uh, uh, basically uh, uh, approximated as 1 over n1 times the sum over the treated ones and uh, minus 1 over n0 times the non-treated ones. And on average, you can very easily prove that they're the same. Okay, so, so these are randomized controlled trials, which means if we can have perturbations, we can directly measure causality. Now, in econometrics, there's a continuum of, of methods with different causal validity. There are observational techniques. Observational techniques means we don't put up anything, and they can only be correct if we have, uh, uh, if, or like they will generally only be correct if we don't have confounding. Now, there are areas in the world where confounding might be very weak and then observational techniques are good. There are, tech, are cases where, where we expect confounding, in which case the techniques will be rather bad, uh, or the results will be rather bad. They will be strongly biased. And in the omitted variable bias equation, we saw the nature of bias that we expect. And then there's what the economists call experiments. For them, experiments doesn't mean that you stick an electrode somewhere. For them, experiment just means that you randomize something. And if you randomize something and you don't have uh, uh, certain kinds of dropout, then, uh, then of course you're good. Now, like, and in that proof for RCTs being correct, it assumes that there is no dropout. No, what if measurements vanish under certain circumstances, which often happens in medicine. No? I assign you to randomly to you get the drug, but it makes you vomit a lot. And you're like, okay, look, I've had enough of this RCT. I'm no longer participating. All of a sudden, this bias makes that this proof is no longer correct. Okay, so, but, but if everything goes fine, then experiments are very strong when it comes to causal validity. And then there's quasi-experiments in between. Quasi-experiments are cases where something is randomized for us. So we don't randomize it, but there's something in the world, something that we can observe, that has a random effect on something, or like an understandable effect on something. And we can then use that effect of that thing in the world to figure out about causality. So let me give you an example of that. There is this thing called Certificate of Merit, which apparently is this a normalized exam that people do, or people did America White. Everyone takes the test. There's no, no cheating. And, and then we take the tests of everyone and we score them. And if you're above some, uh, some uh, score, you, we will give you a certificate of merit for sure. And you can write it into your PH, uh, into your CV and it will say, Conrad get the certificate of merit. And now the idea is that we'd wanna know, does getting that certificate of merit make life easier for Conrad? Not like if we give people these like pieces of paper, we might hope that they have an effect. Now here's the idea, we can, we can draw two hypothetical curves. We can draw the green curve, which is what would happen if everyone would get a, a certificate of merit? And of course, 
um, the certificate of merit might help. We don't know how that would look like. No, like it's possible that it's nonlinear. It's possible that it like really hurts at the bottom. It's possible that it helps at the top. Now, how would we get it? And and we can equally draw such a trajectory for uh, for the other group, for the not treated group. Now, a naive correlational approach. We would just take the people who didn't get the certificate and compare them with people who did get the certificate. No, that would be completely biased, no, because there might be an age effect, a socioeconomic status effect. Everything is different between the treated and the non-treated. But close to the cutoff score, everything will be the same. Why? The exam score is known to be noisy. Now, if I give you the same, if I take you and have you take and retake the exam, you will sometimes be like 45 and sometimes you'll be 55. There's real noise on that. Which means that the people that are just above the threshold must be identical in all other covariates to the people that are just below the threshold. Now, what do we observe? We observe the green curve, the treated curve, only to the right side of the exam score. And we observe the untreated one only to the left of that. But within the vicinity of the cutoff threshold, the two groups must be the same. So if we just try and estimate this jump that is there, we can show that this is, uh, gives us an unbiased estimate of the causal effect of receiving the certificate of merit. And you can easily use Julia Pearl's framework to prove this to be true. And here's just the original data. This is the paper that introduced that by Thistle, Waite, and Campbell. What you do is you fit linear equations on both sides. So you focus on data within the vicinity of the threshold. You fit linear equations on both sides, and you see where that nonlinearity is. And I should say, in the domain of machine learning, it's a very exciting topic at the moment to see how we can take these techniques from econometrics and infuse them with causality. And, uh, and uh, no, infuse them with machine learning. Now, like You can say uh, there's lots of other factors that we could regress out to increase the power. There's all kinds of ways how we can make these things better using machine learning. So. Um, and, and so what they found there is on the y-axis, we had the percent of students winning scholarships. The upper graph is winning scholarships. The lower, gra uh, gra uh, the lower lines are winning a big scholarship. And what we can generally see, and yeah, they went so into error bars back then. But what we could see here is that there's a clear discontinuity happening at the threshold. And we can use that to estimate that it actually is really helpful to get a certificate of merit. Here's another beautiful paper that uh, that estimated the effect of class sizes. It was an instant classic in an Angus paper from 1997. So there's Maimonides rule, which says that no class should have more than 40 pupils. And I know that there's more than 40 people on this live stream, but what, we can't do anything about that. So, but what the effect is that as Schools get bigger. Now, if you have a very small school, you can cram everyone into one class. But if you have 41 people, uh, pupils, you need to have two classes. And so there's this strong discontinuity here in, uh, in the class size. And this is something that one can then use in the context of regression discontinuity to estimate how important it is to have small classes. And indeed, it helps considerably. Can I briefly have a confirmation that my audio is still on? Yes, Conrad. <laughs> awesome, great. I apologize. We had, we had a little trouble when we were setting up. So I will ask, I, I've once at NeuroMatch had a speaker give a whole talk in front of a bad camera. <laughs> and I don't want to do that mistake. Um, so, if we can't see you, I'm monitoring the chat box as well. And I'll, I'll interrupt. So, so uh, great. If you actually turn off my video, it will. my camera will turn black. And, uh, and that way, I would also know. In any case, so uh, what can we do in this context? We can also do sanity checks. Now, like, the whole strategy is conditioned on not uh, on there not being cheating. Now, like, what if people purposefully enrich areas, make sure that their, that their school size is always 41, so that they have two classes? In that case, we could be biased and the whole assumption breaks down. So but what we can do is we can look for cheating. For example, if cheating was going on there, we should see that classes that are 41 versus 39, that they are 
higher socioeconomic status. So there's a whole bunch of ways how one can sanity check for violations of such quasi-experimental methods. I should also measure this fuzzy RDD, which is if uh, compliance isn't perfect and there's some fuzziness in here, but like I won't talk about this today. Now, this is great news because it shows that when there's thresholds involved, we can estimate causal effects. Think about thresholds, you now like neurons have spiking, uh, spiking thresholds, maybe brain areas have activation thresholds. There's all kinds of things like that. But I want to immediately tell you the bad thing. You now like if we have an experiment, we can, uh, we, we have a certain variance that goes as one over square root of the number of data points that we get. Um, but what's the variance of the RDD estimator that I just talked about? Well, there's a geometrical factor that gives us a factor three. There's the variance, and we have the same thing with, ex with regular experiments. Now, but now instead of being able to take everyone for our estimate, we can only take people that are so close to the threshold that we can use them for our local regression. It's also, if not everyone's compliant, there's a one of a P squared dependency in the variance on the ratio that is compliant. The effect is that typically you need far more data points than if you can yourself put up the system. The upside, however, is you don't need to. You just need things with thresholds. And I just want to remind you how common thresholds are. Now, like in medicine, um, I can tell uh, the blood pressure. If it's above some value, you call me high blood pressure. You try and treat me for it. If you're in, if you're in, if you're Google or something, um, if your affinity score to a certain person is above some value, you will show them on the first uh, first screen. Otherwise, you will not show them on the first screen. So this, like, um, like just about any domain that we can think of has these thresholds. And um, uh, no, like uh, in in and also in in the broader like neuroscience related area, no, like treatment questionnaires, where we often use questionnaire scores in. Uh, in in psychiatry, enrolling based on priority scores, you know, like um, at Neuromatch, for example, and we're planning to do that, we match you with someone based on how similar their research is for you. And that's a threshold, you know, like, yes, the person, I maybe I get matched to you, but not to that other guy, because my affinity to, uh, score to you was like 0.93, and my score to them was like 1.05, and therefore, this discontinuity can then be used to see, does being matched with someone at Neuromatch, does that increase the probability that you will be uh, collaborating in the future? And in lots of domains, uh, we, we enroll people based on need, and there you can do pre-planned regression discontinuities. I should also say that there's, a, that, there's a, that there's an optimization problem that we worked on here, where you can say, not only do I want to estimate what the causal effect is of something, but I want to optimize the causal effect. For example, here we looked at taxi drivers and we asked, uh, no, like you, you know that when you take a taxi, it gives you buttons that says, do you want to tap $1, $2 or $3? Or alternatively, it asks you, do you want to tap $15, $20 or $25? And you could say, if I'd be a taxi company, I'd want to optimize at which level I switch from one to the other. I should say now, the same idea can be used for neurons. And this is a great paper by Ben Lansdell, but I wanted to focus on the big conceptual idea. So we'll only go through this very, very briefly, where you could say, well, what if neurons want to launch something? Say the neuron fires, and it also observes maybe through a dopamine signal how successful the animal is. And now you could say there's two ways of doing that. I can either look at my correlation with the reward signal, which is what we have at the top, or alternatively, we can use a causal estimator regression discontinuity design where I look at times where I almost spiked versus at times where I barely spiked. And I throw away the times where I definitely wasn't spiking and the times where I definitely was spiking. And we can see that convergence is much faster if we build a learning rule based on that. And that's great work by Ben Lansdor. So I want to just mention another case. Um, so, 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 so let, let me briefly zoom out. What is happening here? So we have an observed thing, which is what's the score going into something or what's the drive going into a neuron? And you have a treatment, which is basically do I spike or do I not spike? Do I treat, do I not treat? And then we have an outcome of interest. Maybe how good's the animal doing or how good is my life uh, if, I get, uh, if I get or don't get a certificate? Now, 
What we have here is it's identifiable because the difference between score and treatment is effectively a random variable. If I find myself just on one side or just on the other side of the, of the threshold, is locally random. It's as good as random. And this is a very clean definition for it, as good as random, if you're interested in that. Here's another case where something is as good, it could be as good as random. It's called, this approach is called instrumental variables, where you have a variable that is a random variable, or like it's drawn from some distribution that affects one variable and nothing else. So this is the important criterion in instrumental variables that there's, there's a variable that only affects the rest of the world through one variable. Now that the rest of the system can be as confounded as it is. You saw, see the icon here of the earth, which affects both neon one and neon two. But if there was something that only affected one neon, maybe an internal random number generator. And if anyone here is a good molecular biology on screen, like produce, if you could produce a molecular construct that randomly perturbs neurons, then we can figure out all kinds of causality. But it needs to be observable. Now, why could that be important? Um, in neuroscience, there's a very popular technique that's called optogenetics. Uh, there's this idea that optogenetics allows you to locally stimulate something, but that's probably not true. So what do I mean with that? The intensity of the flow of photons goes uh, as one over d squared. So basically, as I go further away from my light guide, intensities go, get weaker. And therefore, people kind of assume, well, that's a local technique. It goes as one over d squared. But there's a problem, because the number of neurons is proportional to d squared. And the product of them, therefore, is constant. So optogenetics in, in a simple model produces the same amount of light per neuron at any distance. So it's not a local technique in that sense. But what's much worse is the current that it produces actually doesn't isn't proportional to the number of photons. It's proportional to the log of that. So what that means is that in optogenetics, you have far more induced activity away from where you stimulate than right where you stimulate. And such things produce confoundings again. Now, like, let's say we have neurons A and B, we want to use opti and we record from A and B and we optogenetically stimulate it. And we would want to use that to figure out how neurons influence one another. Well, in this case, A and B will be strongly correlated. Well, of course, because we illuminate both of them. Now, B and C are actually connected. So we see a strong correlation between B and C, but A and C are strongly connected, uh, are strongly correlated again. Why? Because, well, the light is strongly confounding A and B. Now, um, okay, let me skip over this. Okay, so now we will use, uh, we will use, um, uh, we will use instrumental variables. Here's an example in econometrics where you can say distance to college is arguably a random variable. It's not perfect, but like locally it is, and you can like match people correctly. And now distance, if you're close to, if you live close to a college, you're more likely to attend college. Now, attending college and registering to vote is, we, we want to know, does attending college make you more likely to register to vote? But of course, we know that there's all kinds of confounding factors, you know, like rich people might be more likely to do both. Um, uh, disenfranchised communities might be less likely to do both. Um, so, so there's all this confounding, but there are rich people who live close to the uh, to a college, and there's rich people who live farther away from a college. So the idea then is to use distance to college as an instrumental variable to figure out if attending college affects the chance to register to vote. In our case, what we did is a weird combination where we said being refractory at the very moment where you get stimulated is in first order approximation random which affects spiking and the spiking affects a postsynaptic neon and all the rest of the brain confounds the spiking with the postsynaptic neon. We can set this up, uh, it gives us the so-called Wald estimator. And indeed what we find is that in big simulation, it helps considerably. And we're currently working the way like, we, we had some glitches with the code there, but like we're working on it. Why does it matter? Um, arguably, uh, optogenetics is arguably the best causal tool that we have in your science, but it's crazy hard to target individual cells. And if we work in the right way on causal inference tracks that come from uh, the from the quasi-experimental school, 
uh, then we might be able to cure confounding and really identify how a lot of neurons interact with one another. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we could figure out how the brain interacts with one another. I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe we can figure out like 100 neurons at a time or something. You know, like I, it, it's, we, we've got to be somewhat realistic here. Okay, now I want to briefly, for the machine learning people in the audience, get back to, uh, to machine learning. Now, like, we usually ignore causality. We build great predictive models. But these great predictive models all suffer from confounding just as well as smaller models. And um, and Julia, and a lot of people kind of look at Julia Paul's do calculus, hoping that it can help us get rid of that. No, Julia Paul's do calculus allows us to calculate if it's going to go away. And for just about every application of like causal inference techniques that I see in neuroscience, you can use Julia Paul's framework to prove that causality cannot be obtained. And, and therefore, like, like it's, it's, it's a little mind, uh, mind boggling that, that we just ignore that. Uh, no, and you see a lot of MRI papers that say, here, we do that. And uh, then they say, and it's important that this is a causal technique, open bracket, Julia Paul, close bracket. But Julia Paul, do calculus can be used to prove that causal inference in those domains is impossible. So it's a little baffling to me. And I want to mention in machine learning, now like we, we've all seen David Bly's deconfront. It's getting very popular at the moment. Now, it's the promise to get rid of confounding. And all those economists have been working on it for decades and never figured out how to get rid of confounding. Well, it turns out that it needs to make very, very strong assumptions that are never true in the real world, which is all confounders are independent of one another, which, uh, which I don't think we can meaningfully assume, and in particular, not in medicine or brain science. Now, like, how could the brain have independent sources that make things happen? Causality is hard, is the next point here. We can only do it in quasi-experimental techniques if we already have prior knowledge. And that is against the big promise of machine learning. Now we want intelligence in a, block, in a box. But if we look at the causal inference literature, it's kind of full of Oh yeah, if you could tell me that this thing affects that and nothing else, then I can give you causality. But like, uh, econometric, uh, economics has this solid way of discussing that. In fact, their seminars feel very confrontational for people who are there for the first time. And I think we need to, for the prompts for which we want to use machine learning, really make it front and center. Uh, center. Having predictors of when I die that uses as input, like if I take a drug or not, is absolutely meaningless when it comes to asking if that drug is good for me. So what's the take home message? For the neuroscientist, when we mean, we really mean causality, most neuroscientists when quest about it really want to get it causality. We mean causality when we say mechanism. In many cases, the analysis that we do do not provide meaningful information about causality. Perturbations are the gold standard. Now, like we should do a lot more of them. I love optogenetics, but optogenetics is not an in, not a localized uh, perturbation. Now, like it asks perfectly correctly, what's the causal effect of all these neurons being stimulated? It doesn't ask, well, what's the role of this neuron in a computation? It doesn't scale to higher dimensions. I think quasi experiment are. Uh, mm, uh, an important set of approximation ideas. But for those, we generally need very big data sets. And with this, thanks so much for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot, Conrad. Uh, very nice to hear it. Very interesting. I also learned quite a bit. Uh, so uh, I'll open the floor to questions. Uh, there have been some already. Uh, Conrad, can you also see them? Uh, I can see them. Yes, um, if you would like to answer, yes. So, so here I have a question of Mark Axon that I'm going to read so that everyone's on the same page. If you're not willing to assume structural causal model or causal graph structure, then obvious you can like you cannot perform causal inference in general without interventions. So, if say you want to study how dynamic or cognitive processes interact. Why can't you assume a causal graph which makes assumptions on relationships to confounders and perform causal inference? Okay, this is a great question. So if the brain had the structure that we could say, here's a model of the brain that has, and, uh, that has 10 variables or 100 variables, however many we have, and this was the correct model, 
then we could do inference on it. We could say maybe from reading the literature, we know what those 10 nodes are, however many we have. We know that this node links this node and this node links this node and this node links yet another node and so on and so forth. And then if we have enough data, we can do we can do meaningful uh, causal inference. And and Mark is right that you no, know, like, and we could make assumptions about about confounders. We could say, well, maybe head movement is an important confounder. Maybe motivational state is a confounder, and we can try model that. My worry about that approach is that it is not a model that we actually believe in. You now, like, we can fit the model, and we can always do model comparison. But the space, the question is, what is the set of the space of models that we can believe in? But if we have 10 to the 11 neurons, they interact in really weird ways. And these little conceptual models that we make, we can have a list of confounders for them, but that doesn't represent reality. So in that sense, the way how the model isn't quite right can arbitrarily confound things. And so if I, if I, if I draw that out, that model, maybe 10 variables that seem relevant to my task at hand, and maybe I come up with a handful of confounders or so. Well, there's still 10 to the 11 minus like 100 minus 5, or like minus a very small number of real confounders in that space. And there's no way of getting rid of that. So. So the approach would be correct if we actually believed our models. But we all acknowledge that these models are like a first order approximation. Not like, and, and, and therefore, like the, the methods that we have are only true if we can assume the statistical property that is, uncon that is called unconfoundedness, which is all variables that we do not observe have no meaningful influence on the system. And the word unconfoundedness is almost never found in papers. Now, now, by all means, argue for these models and argue cleanly. And then at least it's clear how people can disagree with one another. Now, like if you build the model of the kind that you just sketched, you could say, here's what I believe the variables are. Here's what I believe the confounders to be. And I believe that there exist no additional confounders. Now, if I do a single experiment where I perturb an extra axis and I find that two variables in the network change, then I will have disproven that, and therefore you will have to take back your model. But that is not how we currently say that. It's kind of we hide these problems behind, behind kind of an ambiguity about causality. Let's just be honest. We mean causality and let's write our assumptions. And I admire that you're trying to make this clean. And in that sense, thanks so much for the great question, Mark. Should I take Guillaume's question as well next? It's the, yes, yes, and everyone, yes. you should vote on the question. Now, there will be questions mm -hmm. that you think are awesome. And then there's questions that you like less. Vote on them because otherwise I will answer the questions that you don't even find interesting. So, so here's the next thing. Do you think quasi experiments can be useful to scale larger than neurons? For example, the type of scales that are studied by neuroimaging techniques, such as EEG, MEG, ECOG. And this is a question by Guillaume. So possibly. Um, it depends on which models you have. Now, like, if you could tell me that there is a brain area, and this brain area has the property that it's silent or effectively silent up to a given threshold. And above that threshold, it will go boom and have an effect. And you also give me a way of basically measuring that in good enough fidelity. Then yes, I could use a regression discontinuity design to basically look at these transitions where it transitioned versus it almost transitioned. And I can use that transition point to then see how that area influences other areas. Now, do I believe that model? Probably not. No, so part of my message is we want to be clear, but part of it is also, it is at least possible that we cannot get the causality that we want. And I often get this, this argument, but like, look, Conrad, you can't say those things unless you give us an alternative to get at causality. No, I can say that, and I can say, it's possible that it is impossible to get at causality without perturbations. And it is absolutely a hypothesis that we should entertain. And it's one that is 
hidden. And as soon as I say something about it, like I get attacked by like a big set of people. No, it's like, it's like we are scientists and we need to deal with the uncomfortable possibilities. And the uncomfortable possibility could be that we cannot measure causality and that's okay. Now, like we can then get to, to perturbation techniques, not TDCS, TMS, optogenetics. There's, there's a lot of perturbative techniques. So next I want to take a question by Dehua Ling. Well, I just managed. No, here it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, by Dehua Ling, uh, Liang, oh, I'm not good at pronouncing names. I apologize for mangling yeah. your, uh, your name. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on the proof of not able to obtain causal relationships in the brain in Julia Paul's framework? Are you saying that causal relationships cannot be obtained at the neuronal level? What is what if causal inference for functional areas of the brain obtained from neural imaging techniques? Okay, so yes, it's very easy. Uh, causal effect gets to be identifiable uh, if uh, either the vector or the front door criterion are, are given. Um, it's it's uh, it, it basically boils down to if I have a causal variable and I observe all variables that feed into it and I'm not screwed up by some other stuff. Then I can identify what the effect is. There's the vector criterion. There's the front door effect, which is if I observe all variables that are observed by one of uh, that are affected by one of my variables, I can use that as a trick to in, to infer what the causal effect of one variable is. In practice, I, I've never, I believe, seen a case where front door criterion is doable in a real world setting. The vector criterion. Let's be clear what that means. We need complete non-noisy observation of all variables that feed into one variable. That would be all neurons that feed into a brain area or like all neurons that feed into an individual neuron. And, um, and so, yes, in that sense, uh, you can directly say, okay, here's your technique with which you record. Do you have noise in the variables that you observe? Uh, therefore, um, Therefore, or do you not observe all of them independent, independently? Therefore, you cannot obtain causality. And that, that's, that's how it works. So are you saying that causal uh, relationships cannot be obtained at the neuronal level? Um, no, I'm not saying that. With perturbations at the neuronal level, you can establish causality at the neuronal level. If you give me intracellular electrodes, let's say you have neurons in a dish, you give me intracellular recordings of 100 neurons, and I can observe when they spike and when they almost spike, yes, I can give you causality. So I'm not at all saying that it cannot be obtained, but can it be obtained from the correlation matrix if I only partially observe the system? No, they cannot be obtained if we partially observe the system. F e uh, FMRI, EEG, typical MEG, typical spike recording techniques, none of them have the criteria that would allow identifying the causal effects. Now you could say, well, um, what about simulation studies? Uh, there have been some simulation studies where they looked at that. Uh, the best that I know is from Washington and I'm blanking on the Eric, I believe, Cher uh, Brown lab, uh, where they say that, yes, if you record half the neurons, it will sometimes work. Um, so, so there, there are there are cases like that. But if we're in the typical domain, then yes, it probably is impossible. Uh, what uh, if causal inference for functional areas of the brain obtained from neural imaging techniques? Yes, these are not causal estimates. Uh, they, in my definition of causality, they are not counterfactuals. They all use weird redefinitions of the word causality that I don't want to rant about here. But basically, from a causal inference perspective, uh, these are, none of these are valid methods for estimating causality. Um, let's see. Um, okay, Granger causality. Uh, Granger causality, I talked briefly about it in the beginning. Now, you saw this regression that I showed. You can, for Granger causality in a partially observed system, just as well write out the omitted variable bias equation. It looks just the same. So the estimates from Granger causality just as well are not causal estimates. And, and, and maybe let me be precise because the fields mean something different. In the econ framework, we say causality can be identified, or in the causal inference, in the statistical causal inference uh, framework, we say that causal inference can be identified usually if we can show that 
if we get enough data, the biases go away. Now, and there's cases where the biases are small. We call that an observational technique. It only approximates causality, but it can't provide like solid estimates there. Now, when it comes to brain data, we can estimate that the biases that we should have should be many, many, many orders of magnitude bigger than the effects. And this is the domain where we really hope isn't very good. Um, okay, here we have, let me take the next question. Uh, it is by Dean Rance who asks, is there a sense in which RDD measurably suffers from multiple testing? Okay, so the bulk of RDD methods today are pre-planned. It usually works like that, where someone like looks at a domain and says like, wow, isn't that cool? Like they have a class threshold where it can be at most 42. Then they call up some people and say, hey, are they cheating on that? And they figure out that it's not cheating. And then they write a big discussion that it's not cheating. So in that sense, there's usually not multiple testing. Like it, basically you take one effect, it takes a lot of data cleanup. But we want to move these techniques into machine learning. And that, of course, gets to be much more problematic. Now, like, how do we find these thresholds? Can we automatically detect that there's thresholds? Now that we have these thresholds, well, now what if there's multiple of them? And then it gets more problematic. And say we did a, a, did a stroke-related regression discontinuity study that hopefully will soon be published, uh, where we find absolutely no effect of uh, of uh, of uh, at the threshold. But um, uh, but in this domain. In, in if we want to move it to machine learning, we will have to very much worry about multiple testing. You know, like if we have a machine learning system that say crawls through medicine, looks for thresholds, well, like we'll be testing a lot of them. Uh, what if it like makes thresholds? So, so I'm very much interested in machine learning approaches to make RDD approach, uh, make RDDs on the machine learning side. Then yes, we very much need to worry about it. And I do think, do not think that that field is fully developed yet. Cool. So now here comes the first question that I will be really bad at answering. Oh, it's been downvoted. Oh my God, that is best thing ever. Um, uh, hold on. No, it has not. Oh, sad. Uh, okay. So now, um, now you will see me fail on something. So uh, Griffith Rees asks if I see parallels between causal inferences in the neuroscientist. And the debates of the Chris Takis Fowler contagion of ob obesity paper, in all likelihood, yes. But I can't, uh, I can't give it a few minutes to make sure that this is uh, that that this is what I mean here. Um, uh, by the way, Aditya, you could me uh, do me a great favor if you could go to the ask a questions thing and mark the questions by clicking answer finished answering for all of those that I already answered because okay, I'm cool. Yeah, I think it's, people it's, vote like they, they kind of move in that thing. Yes, I'll do that. Um, yeah, okay, this is a great question by Harrison Ritz. Do people use any of these causal learning methods during observational learning? And the answer almost certainly is yes. So here's the simplest. Um, there's like these great experiments with blicket detectors, I believe, Alison Gottnick, where already babies do these things of experimenting with things. I want to see if something has a certain causal power, and I do specific perturbations to get there. Now, uh, what else? So let me give you an example of... Uh, of uh, of where where uh, where what, what what's it called instrumental variables uh, could be used by human beings. I observe people do things. There's some really intelligent people, and I know they have plans, and uh, and I I know that I can't understand their plans. There's other people that are maybe doing a very simple algorithm. You know, like I know they go like left right left right, or they they they, they run a very simple strategy. I want to understand how the world works. Will I look at the people that I know use very complicated strategies, or will I use it the behavior of the people that use very simple strategies? Well, I look at the simple people because in a way I understand their policy, and therefore it gets to be a random variable that I can use to figure out how other things work. So if I want to say work, uh, work out how a certain problem works, I might want to use someone who uses a simple strategy because they help me 
reverse engineer how something else works in the world. But that would be like super cool to do experiments in that space. Thanks so much for the question, Harrison. Now, here I have a question by Zach Danziger, who I know very well. well thanks for the question, Zach. Uh, if neural activity lies on a manifold that is far, far lower in dimensionality than the number of neurons, are we still required to record all neurons to get to causality to remove confounds, or can we settle for getting enough of them to estimate the manifold? For M1, people argue all the time for low, uh, low effective dimensionality. So, unfortunately, Zach, um, I, th I, th I think the question is deeper. So, so it's 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 a it's it's a popular idea that there's basically uh, dimensions along which uh, that are relevant, and that these dimensions causally interact with one another. But it's unclear what that means for a dimension to causally interact with uh, with one another. Now, like, I don't believe that all the neurons that lie in the manifold have the same causal effect on a manifold. And therefore, it's unclear what that even means. But if the model was true, now, like, and again, it's like oftentimes causality is possible if we have prior knowledge of a model to be true. If it was true that kind of we have that overall activity and only that activity mattered, no, it doesn't. Didn't matter who's active within that, uh, within that manifold. Mm -hmm. In that case, and so, so we basically have a small number of variables that matter. We don't know how many manifolds. You know, the M1 people like twenty or something. It depends on what you work with. Um, and um, and uh, and we believe that model. Then. And we could noiselessly observe them, and we could maybe perturb them even. Then, yes, absolutely, we could identify them. Now, do I believe that M1 is actually all that low dimensional? Probably not. We have 200 muscles. We can probably individuate every individual muscle. And like this is the smallest principal component of hand movement. Um, uh, and uh, in 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 time matters. Now, like I plan, M1 is involved in in all likelihood is somewhat involved in planning, it's involved in reward, it, it, it probably cares for a lot of things that are not visible in the way people do the analysis. Now, if you take stuff and you average it across lots of times, a lot of the interesting things happening will average away and it's not so low dimensional. But Zach, it's absolutely possible that it is low dimensional and in that case, and that it doesn't matter which neuron is which in that group. And in that case, it's absolutely possible that uh, we could causally identify things there. Because not, not like for people who aren't from that field, where you can like meaningfully get hundreds up to thousands of neurons into motor cortex. So if motor cortex is pretty low dimensional, we can hope to relatively noiselessly observe those ripples. Great. I already answered Harrison's question, I think. Um, I have a question of Alex. Alex, I meet you everywhere. It's just a little bit shocking. Um, uh, Alex's question is, do we have a better chance to understand causality in machine learning neural networks than in the brain? If so, given that at least for certain brain areas, neural networks are good models, shall we start there rather than going directly to the brain? OK. The answer uh, of uh, of it is is yes. So we are currently developing methods to reverse engineer the brain. Now, like, and we don't know how good they are. And we, I had this microprocessor paper that basically shows that, that there can be problems with these approaches, and um, and we don't know if these methods work well. Maybe neural networks are a good model for the brain. Maybe they're not. Like, like. This is not what this talk is about. But if they are, and let's say let's say they might be a good model for the brain. Not only that, but they might even replicate that primary motor cortex is like low dimensional for uh, Danziger here. But um, but if that was the case, well, let's just simulate a neural network with similar parameters to the brain and make sure that our methods would reveal how it works. No one's shown that they're able to meaningfully reverse engineer like such a neural network. 
much less the brain. But starting with neural networks, I think, is the way to go because we, we write all these papers with causal insights about the brains that we can't be sure about it. Well, just make sure that it works on simulated systems and simulated systems that aren't of the thing that you're looking for. Now, like, if you want to show that you can identify a 100-dimensional fully observed system and you're like, I you simulate a hundred dimensional fully observed system, sure it works, but no, like simulate like a million neurons in all those hundred areas and show that it then still works. Those, uh, those things are not really being done. And I think it's a big mistake and it uh, exposes us to the risk that things that we might do might be wrong or misleading. Thanks for the question, Max. Um, okay, I answered Mark and... Griffith. Um, I think this is a new one by Mark, is it? Um, it's a, probably a yeah. follow-up to yours, no? To what you said. No, no, no I definitely no, answered one. Mark. Uh, and I also definitely not answered Griffith's uh, question, but I, I admitted that I am ignorant about this paper. At least I can't recall it at the moment. So, so... Uh, Oh, okay. Here's actually a follow-up work. Uh, uh, thanks, Mark, for the follow-up. So, or maybe it's not a follow-up. It's another question by Mark at the bottom. I know there's been some work of developmental psychology to understand how humans might do causal inference, for example, by Alison Gopnik. Do you know of any labs that are investigating this problem from a more neuroscience perspective? Yes, there's a whole bunch of labs like interested in causal inference in the brain at the moment. That includes people like Yuta Nopane, who's using fMRI to study causal inference. It, um, uh, there's a lot of observation studies where you put someone into the scanner where they observe causal things. I can't recall the names of people in that community at the moment. But basically, if you look for causal inference, uh, uh, psychology, you should be able to find a good literature. But but yes, this is a super exciting area. And now we get to the last question, which is by Chaga Jack Soluke. At the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that you identify as a transdisciplinary enthusiast. Um, uh, I think I said optimist, but like, yeah, I'm also an enthusiast. I would too. How would you advise a neuroscientist who is scratching the surface with regards to applying machine learning in their work on neuroimaging beyond simply being aware of the possibility that causality without perturbations are impossible? Any ways to join future projects, collaborations, talk beyond this one? Okay, this is a great last question, actually. Um, okay, but it, it's, it's a multi-part uh, question. So... Machine learning and and and, uh, and brain data. There's a lot of techniques that have no conceptual issues whatsoever. Now, like, if you use machine learning to tell me I'll get Parkinson's disease, I can change my life to optimize for that. So, and if you can build a good decoding algorithm, I lost my arm in an accident. You can decode it really well. We built a prosthetic device for me. I can move my hand again, like Luke Skywalker, which is one of my favorite Star Wars scenes. Um, then ultimately, uh, this is awesome. Like it, it really makes life better for people. That's what things are about. Um, and in that sense, like there's a direct application of machine learning in your imaging that is perfectly meaningful. Now, the question there is, of course, we need to stop playing this two card game. Now, like there are a lot of people, they build, uh, they, they, they write papers about how the brain works and they write papers about biomarkers. And if I then go to them and say, well, your biomarker is so bad that I can't imagine how you'd ever get from, from your 55% to what would be clinically relevant, maybe like, you know, like if we tell half of the Americans that they have Parkinson's disease, that wouldn't go over very well. Um, and and I tell them basically like look uh, this is um, this is not um, uh, this is this isn't a good enough biomarker. They say well, but like look, we understand about the brain by doing this research. And then I look at the what they understand about the brain, and it's not clear which biological statements they can make about the brain. And I push them on those biological statements, and then I hear like but look it's medical research, we build biomarkers to drive things. And they play both of them. As soon as you attack one of them, they like pull out the other card. Uh, that's how problematic. So I think it's important if we do machine learning for 
medical disease recognition, then let's do that well. Let's let's do that and basically say, okay, how good do we need to be so that this is medically relevant? Can we realistically get there? What does it take to get there? What's the best approach to get there? And the models don't need to be like informed by the brains. In fact, like usually for machine learning competitions, uh, neuroscience inspiration isn't all that useful. You just want to like brute force machine learning thing, uh, mach um, brute force machine learning things. There's other places where machine learning has a role. Now, like if I want to ask, is there information about X in some area? Then machine learning is a great tool. No, I can if I can decode somewhat from it, it proves that there's information about X. So that's the question that occurs within the question being asked. But it's not the machine learning that does the the conceptual work. The conceptual work is the idea that I believe it's meaningful if the brain area carries information about something. And that's an interesting question. So, so, so in that sense, I think if you if you do machine learning in your sense, just be very clear why and what the results are of that. So, so what else do we have? Um, uh, oh, it just went away. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so so the, yeah, I, I I I can't I can't answer the last question. I just don't have an informed answer to that. Um, I think this was a great. The previous was oh, hold on, it's back. Okay, awesome. What? Okay, here. Uh, cool. Let me just see. Any ways to join future projects, collaboration talks beyond this one? Okay, this is great. Uh, so we are running Neuromatch Academy this summer, which will basically teach data scientists to a really, really broad community of people. If you're relatively new getting into like machine learning, data science, advanced data analysis, and so forth, that could be a fun thing. The the interactive track where you work very closely with TAs has closed a few days ago, but uh, but that's the the open track where you can, the observer track where you can basically go and see all the talks and like uh, and and do the Python tutorials and get all the training in that area. And for some people here, it may very well uh, be useful. Um, now the question is: uh, Any ways to join future projects collaborations? Yes, just like if you're interested in something, uh, some area, just email the professors doing the research that you admire. And like a lot of people are very welcoming to newcomers in the field. Um, uh, so, so here's a follow up, and that, that will be the last question I take, I think, uh, which is what about using machine learning for predictions, such aiming to predict a visual stimulus from imaging data? Yes, so so let's think through that approach, just the logic of that. So I show an image, you see it, you lie in my scanner, I get all the voxels out. And maybe I use 1,000 images. And let's say I'm able to say, yeah, you were looking at image 317. Now, is that useful? Well, it depends. Now, it depends on what you want to do. If you, for some reason, need to... Uh, spy on something. Now, let's say I want to like, I'm the secret service. I want to listen to your inner monologue or something. Then, yeah, there's like a real application for that. Um, I'm not sure what the other real applications are for it. Now, like, what does it show? It logically shows that there is information about image identity in the MRI signal, which is great. But but we knew that beforehand, and like we did know that the brain has information about what they see. In fact, if I would take the subject and kind of say, okay, actually, like I will then quiz you in on what's that image. And they're good at paint at drawing them and be able to draw the painting. And like now we can like paint based on the MRI images, like probably much worse than them. But like we knew that that information was there. So this is a cool tech demo, and like we can decode the images from it. But it's entirely unclear what the scientific question that is worth it, because we have it, it is it, this ability to decode is exclusively ex the existence proof that information about the identity of the image is contained in it. It doesn't go beyond that. So it's a cool proof that we can do cool things with new, uh, with with neuroscience data, but it doesn't contribute to a real understanding of the brain. Cool. Uh yeah, I mean, look, look, like, uh, there was just another follow-up by Chugga, Jack. Um, yes, like there absolutely can be meaningful brain machine interface things. Now, like give me like a little something on my head, decode how I want to move my arms. If I'm paralyzed, please do it. 
Great. So yeah, we've had a great set of questions and it's wonderful uh, seeing you answer them very uh, yeah, comprehensively. Conrad, uh, I guess, yeah, it's been a good long session and uh, I hope uh, we will be in touch also for the future and thanks a ton for joining us. Um, with that, let's thank uh, Conrad again. Uh, thanks everyone also for coming on and joining us. Thank, thanks for, thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, no, thanks a ton. And the, please come also for other worldwide neuro talks as well as for Sheffield ML talks on Thursdays. Okay, ciao everyone. Thank you. I'll